Hey, if you have your Bibles, Matthew 21 is where we're going to be today. This is the season to stay up late on Saturday nights, so I hope you're ready to be awake this morning, because I think God has an important word for us through Jesus, and I uh, hope you're ready to be engaged, and um, it's not my words, it's his words. Uh, but before we jump into our passage today, it's been a couple of weeks since I've preached, and, um, and since we looked at the last passage, so I just want to catch you up, because it's so important what happened in the last passage as to why Jesus says what he does right here and right now. And, um, and so if you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, before Labor Day, uh, we looked at the passage right before this, and it was this awesome passage where Jesus, uh, where the Pharisees come and ask Jesus a question, and then he says, I'll answer your question if you answer my question. And, uh, and he said, uh, what about John's baptism? Was that from God or from human beings? And, uh, and they were like, oh, no, we're in trouble now. And so they get in this huddle, and they think, what are we going to say? Because if we say it's from, from God, then, then we are in trouble because we didn't do what John told us to do. We didn't live into the, the, the word that John had for us. If we say it's not from God, then the people are going to get really mad because they love John, and it's great. And so they come back to Jesus, and they say, we don't know. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, come on. I know you're tired. I know you're tired, but we, this is a, a participatory event here, and um, we don't know. And so Jesus says, then I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> Come on. I probably stayed up later than anybody here. And uh, we're going to get through this. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Um, and so that's what sets up this parable. Jesus tells a parable in the passage that we're going to look at today. And, um, it, it, but you've got to have that backstory. And so if you don't have a Bible, Pew Bible page number on the screen, we are going to look at a lot of scripture today, a lot of scripture. So I hope you brought a Bible. And like I said, if you didn't, there's a pew Bible. Uh, because I think the, the, the parable is, um, obviously it's biblical, but I think the Bible this speaks big into it. So we're going to be in the Old Testament and New Testament all over today. And uh, we're really just going to hopefully let the Bible in reinforce what Jesus is trying to say in this parable. And so it's going to be a lot of reading this morning, scripture, and talking about what we find. Uh, so if you're there, and uh, one of you would stand with me, if you're able to read or able to stand as we read God's word together this morning, Matthew chapter 21, we'll start reading in verse 28. What do you think? That's a good question. There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Next slide. This is the word of God for the people of God. And you said, thanks be to God. You may be seated this morning. Let's, uh, let's pray one more time. Big words from Jesus. Tax collectors. Uh, let's, let's pray. God, we, we don't make any claims that we know how to do this well. So we need you to, to enlighten our minds and our hearts so that we can be more like you. And this is a holy thing to talk about your words to the people, and uh, we don't want to do that without reverence and respect, and we don't want to do that on our own. And Lord, uh, so we need you to, to soften our hearts. We need you to open our minds and our ears so that we can hear Open our eyes so that we can see you. And I know nobody needs you more now than, than I do. And so, God, may, um, may my words be pleasing to you. And may my thoughts lift you up. And, God, I just want you to be glorified right now. In Jesus' name. So this is a biblical issue. Now, Jesus tells a story. There's two sons, and um, 
The father goes to the first son and says, hey, go to the field and work. And he says, nah, but he does it anyway. The second one, he goes and says, hey, go to the field and work. He says, okay, I will, but he doesn't go. And so Jesus asked this question, who did what the father wanted? And the answer, the Pharisees answered, the first one, the first one. So there's this big, um, there's this big understanding that we got to get at here that, that, that what is taking place, that there's a difference between what you say and what you do. Huge difference between what you say and what you do. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. So not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will, will enter into heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. Now, this is a tricky thing because, you know, it's, we're not saved by what we do. But our, sal our salvation causes us to do certain things. So we're not saved by works, and we're not saved by deeds, and we're not saved. But if, if we say that, that, that would, then that means we just do whatever we want to. We get saved, and then we can just live however we want to. That's not what the Bible says. That's, that's not scriptural. It's not biblically based. And that's why Jesus tells this parable. There was a guy that's like, yeah, I'll go work, and he doesn't. And then there's a guy that's like, no, I won't. And then he actually does. Who was right? one who actually did what he was supposed to do. Now, last, uh, last Sunday night or last Sunday, I had announced that I was going to go to the Buckeyes game yesterday. And, um, and, and, and so, uh, and, 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 and Matt, who, who took me, Matt Hodge, it's like, hey, do you want a, a jersey or something? It's like, no. Are you crazy? That's silly talk. I'm going to be wearing my Alabama stuff. And um, I've got all the stuff I need to go to the Buckeye game. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I wear the colors of my team, not another team. And so after church, um, Karen Pollard came up to me. and was like, Pastor, what's going on? I thought you were an Alabama fan. Why are you going to the Buckeye game? What is happening to you? What's going on? And I was like, don't worry, Karen. I just love college football. And now don't worry. I, I will be wearing my colors of my team. And I'm not switching. I'm not doing anything. I am I'm going as an Alabama fan for the college football experience. And then Karen did something that just blew my mind. She goes, because I've been reading about Alabama. And you know that they have this guy, number 90, who's uh, Jared Reed, and he weighs this much pounds, and he plays this. I was like, what is going on here? So I'm converting people faster than you're converting me. I just want you to know. And um, roll tide. And, um, and so we go from there. And uh, <laughs> But I assured her. I let her know. I said, Karen, don't worry. There is nothing. I, I think I told her, I said, um, it, it, it's, it's going to be a while before anything like that ever happens. Um, and, and by a while, I mean, it'll probably never happen until Jesus comes. And so forever. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't worry. But I could have been talking all about, man, I'm Alabama, Alabama, Alabama. And, and then when I show up to a Buckeye game, and if I had all Buckeye stuff on, you would be like, you're doing something different than what you profess you are. And that's silly. But it's kind of like that example. You're, you're, you're saying one thing, but you're doing something totally contrary to what that is. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Let's flip over to Matthew chapter 8. Now, this is interesting. Now, some people say, well, yeah, but I, I know who Jesus is, and I, I believe in Jesus, and I, I call him by name. And we just read the passage. It's not about calling Jesus by name. It's about what we do. And we say, yeah, but I know Jesus, and I think Jesus is cool, and Jesus is awesome, and it's so cool. Uh, but there's just a, a little bit of news i got to let you know about. Matthew chapter 8, verse 29. Jesus is, is talking to this guy, these people who are demon-possessed. In verse 29, he's having a conversation with the demons, and they say, what do you want with us? Son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Here's the news. Even the demons know who Jesus is. They, they got it figured out. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? They know exactly who he is. 
And so there's got to be something more than just saying, I think Jesus is cool and, and Jesus is my homeboy or Jesus is cool. And he does. It's got to be more than what you say. There's something to this Christian life that has to do with how we live and who we are and what that looks like. Um, turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 15. I told you a lot of scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 15. So in this story, um, Saul goes to battle, and the prophet Samuel told Saul, when you go to battle, get rid of everything. Don't keep any sheep or goats or cow or, or cloth or treasures. Like, get rid of it all. we got to just cleanse the land. We can't keep any unholy thing here. Get rid of it all. And so then uh, Samuel comes. It's this beautiful, funny story. As he comes to Saul and says, why didn't you do what the Lord wanted you to do? Because instead of getting rid of everything, they kept some of the cattle and the sheep and, and the goats and, and, and whatever. And he's like, why didn't you get rid of everything? And Saul's like, or hey, Samuel comes up and Saul's like, we did what the Lord wanted. And Samuel goes, then why do I hear a sheep in the background? What is that bleeding noise I hear? What is going on? Because God told you to get rid of it all and you didn't obey. And then Samuel's like, yeah, but we were going to offer a sacrifice. We were going to use it as a sacrifice. We were going we to give it back to God. And, and, and then we have this beautiful verse, verse 22 of Sam, 1 Samuel 15. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey oh, is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. This is mind blowing because God had set up this whole sacrificial system and here comes Samuel saying, God would rather you just obey him than give him things. God would rather you just do what he's asking you to do rather than sacrifice and do that whole thing. The whole point of sacrifice is so that your sins can be forgiven so that you can then obey God and do what he's calling you to do. So to obey is better than sacrifice. And so in Old Testament, we get this, this picture in this, the, the first book and, uh, of what this looks like and, and how we're supposed to live and what it means. And so it's not just what you say, it's in how you act and how you obey. It's not just, just the, the proclamation and, and it's not just in, yeah, Jesus is cool and I have a sticker on the back of my car and, and a cross is on my Facebook page. It's not just saying it. But how is your life talking about who Jesus is? Uh, James speaks about this in James chapter 2 on the other side of the Bible. Other side of the Bible, James chapter 2. Isn't this fun? Oh, man, I woke up this morning just so excited about this. Sad that Alabama lost, but excited about what we're going to talk about this morning. James chapter 2. Oh, this is good stuff. James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence for your faith without deeds is useless? Was it not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that people are justified by what they do and not by faith alone. So this guy Abraham, the reason it was credited him as righteous is because he did what God told him to do. He obeyed what God had commanded him to do. He didn't just talk the talk. He lived it out with everything that he does. And so what does God want from us? What is God's, how do we obey God and what does that look like? Uh, let's go to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Verse number 6 is where we will be. With what shall I come before the Lord? 
and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, for the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Verse 8. He has shown you all, all you people, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your Lord. What does the Lord require? To act, do something. Action word. To love, action word. And to walk, action word. To, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And so Jesus is getting that. The first son said no, but he went and did it anyway. And the second son said yes, and he didn't go and do it. Which one was right? The one who actually did what the Father wanted him to do. Because Jesus was saying it's more than what you say. It's how you act. It's how you live. That's what makes you who you are. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 28. This may be some of the hardest words that we're going to hear this morning. The second part of verse 31, Jesus said, Then truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. Um, you know, it's funny. I... As I'm studying Matthew, like God is just ex speaking in my life in ways that are um, huge. And um, it just seems like, and this is hard, <laughs> every time Jesus got upset, it was at church people. Every time he had bad words to say about somebody, it wasn't about those people. It was about, it's bad English, but us people. We, us. Every time Jesus has a negative word to say about anything, it's about the people that, that are supposed to be in the church and they get it and they understand and they're, they're walking and they're taught. I mean, they're live, supposed to be living it out and yet Jesus sees right through what they're trying to do and who they're trying to be. And he looks at them and he says, you don't understand the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors are getting into this kingdom ahead of you. And for those people who heard that, the Pharisees, they hated those people. And so this was like Jesus saying, all your enemies, they get it, and you don't. You don't get it. Because you see, you, you have this backwards. You, you talk a good game, and, and man, you talk eloquently, and you talk about the law, and you talk about God, and it sounds good. But man, if you look at your life, there's something missing in how you're living and what you're doing and who you think God actually is and who he wants you to be in the world. And you're turning people away. We, we talked about this quote before from Brendan Main, uh, next slide, but it says this, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. People who are like, yay, Jesus, he's awesome, he's the greatest. And then go and live however they want to. And then people look and say, well, if, if it doesn't change the way you live, why do I want to waste a Sunday morning? I'm just being honest. And if there's no, no difference about how you live and how I live, why well, I'll just do whatever I want to on Sunday morning. I, I got a whole Sunday morning. I, there's no reason for me to go because our lives are exactly the same. And, and you're professing this and doing this, but there's nothing different about who you are and how you're living and what that looks like. And, and, and so there's just no reason. And so I'll, there must not be a God if he's not making a difference in your life and not changing who you are and talking about it. And, and if there's no difference in who you are, then there must really not be anything to this whole God thing. So I just won't believe. I'll just go do whatever I want biggest, single, greatest cause of atheism are Christians who profess it with their mouth and go living exactly the way they want to. An unbelieving world simply finds that unbelievable. Stephen Manley picks that up and takes it to the next level. Next slide. There's nothing more repulsive than wordy testimonies and little life experience. 
So yesterday we went to this thing called the Skull Session. If you've never been to a Buckeyes game, it's this thing that they go into the old gym and um, you know, just I love that place. It's so cool. And um, and the band plays and the team walks in and Urban Meyer says something and I didn't tell Matt I was going to share this, but I, Matt was so mad at Urban Meyer yesterday because in the Skull Session, Urban Meyer says you're going to see a good football team today. <laughs> He said, and he was like, after the game, he's like, he should not have said that. He told us we were going to see a good football team, and that was not a good football team on the field. A lot of words, people cheering, woo, no action. Did not back up. It's kind of like, um, I know these are all sports analogies, but like last week, uh, the one guy from Arkansas was talking about the Ohio State Buckeyes, went out, his team lost to some scrub team. A lot of words. No action. I'd rather you tell me honestly than give me a lot of hype and don't back it up. He goes on to say, uh, the eyes, this is on the screen, in the eyes of the world, there's nothing worse than dynamite phrases and firecracker living. Our communities are tired of a gospel that professes much but performs little. If everyone who stood at our altars, this is huge, and took membership vows, lived those promises, we would be a force to be reckoning with. Our church would have no financial problems if everyone who pledged to tithe actually would. Thank you. If everyone who's saying he is Lord actually submitted to his sovereignty, we would have an unprecedented evangelism explosion. Obedience. Next slide, and then he goes on to say this, and the, fin the final test is then actual demonstration in life's experience. It is not what you say, but how you flow, Jesus. His life must be seen in the actions of living. He, this is great. He is not seen in our talk, but he's seen in our obedience. And then I had this huge in my notes. Your actions speak so loud, and we cannot hear what you say. Your actions are screaming at us, and because they're screaming at us, we can't hear what's actually coming out of your mouth. Does your obedience level match your talk level? This is the final issue. We'll discover on the final day of judgment, I believe. We talked about this in our teen class this morning. The judgment doesn't come from God. How did I live? I think we're going to look at it in a couple months, Matthew 25. seems like should be sooner than that, but, um, but when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, he asks them the question, what did you do with the least of these? We fed them, we visited them in prison, we clothed them, we, we, we did all that. Because when you did it for them, you did it for me. And then he looks at the ones on his left, we didn't do that stuff. I was trying to show you, this is, Bible, this is not me. Don't hear me saying this. This is scripture, what scripture is trying to say to us. So he will take the church, or when will the church realize that we're more than programs and, and Sunday school classes and Wednesday night programs and understand that we've got to be living a life every other day of the week or the programs and the Sunday school classes and the church services, they're just pointless. When are we going to realize that it's got to be more than just figuring out what we're going to do on a Sunday morning and Wednesday night? All that stuff is important. We need Sunday school classes and, and church services and Wednesday night programs. But if that's all it is, it's just a waste of time. If it's not making a difference in how we live on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday all the days of the week, if it's not making a difference in how we act towards our brothers and sisters, if it's not making a difference in how we see the world, then it's just words coming and going. It's just big talk with little action. It's dynamite phrases with firecracker living. And Jesus is saying here, don't just be people who talk the game, but be people who live and obey with everything that you are. This other guy, and I'm almost done. It says this, although this context applies, we'll get to that in just a minute, the parable of judgment is for the Jewish religious leaders. Matthew makes it into a wider congregation. Because Christians, and this is hard to believe, we can become blind to what God is doing in the world around us. And in this, how easily church work degenerates into little more than simply maintaining the institution. 
with no excitement concerning what God's active grace is doing, and consequently no enthusiasm for evangelism and renewal. We say that we're going to go work in the vineyard, but instead of harvesting the grapes, we spend our time rearranging the stones along. Um, so God is looking at us and he's saying to, to me and I just say he's looking at me he's like you realize that the path is to get you to where the people are the path is important the church is important our doctrine's important. I spent two weeks with the teens talking about our articles of faith and about being lit. But if all we do is, is tend to that, and all we do is, is think about that, I, I think people look and say, man, you're really concerned about this, and there's, there's so much more that you could be about here. But God looks at me and and Jeremy, I've been so faithful over your life again and again and again and again and again. And that's awesome. And then what I really want your prayer to be is, is, is not God come like you did in, in, in 1996 when you went to that altar of prayer. What I want your prayer to be is God fall fresh on me in 2015. What I want your prayer to be is God, I, whatever it is you need to do in my life, I don't want to get so concentrated on, uh, on what I think is just so, and listen, I think it's so important. I love to have the, the conversations and, and, and dialogue and what that looks like, but we get so focused on, on what we think this has to be that we miss what God might be calling us to do in our workplace and in our neighborhoods and on the streets and in the schools and in the chief and in the park. And we, we might miss that God say, I, I, the reason we do this is so that you can go and be different wherever you find yourself in life. The reason we get together and sing songs and, and listen to some silly guy talk for 20 minutes, okay, it's probably more than 20, but I didn't talk for 20 minutes. The reason we do all this stuff is so that you can then go and be Jesus wherever you find yourself. And if there's no difference in how you live and there's no difference in what they see in everybody else, then how are they going to know the transformation that Jesus can make in their life as well? It's one thing to say, I go to the church of the Nazarene. It's another thing to say, I am living the way that God wants me to live. Come on, people. That's good preaching. Not me, him. It's not about what happens at 210 Dooley Drive. It's about what God does on the inside. It's about God transforming our hearts. It's about God taking our heart of stone and giving us this heart of flesh. And if that doesn't happen, then it's just routine and it's just fun and it's just it's just a good time. But I mean, if we allow God to transform us and we start to live differently and we start to be different and we start to go places and we say, you know, I don't care what you do. This is who God's called me to be. I don't care if I'm in a Buckeye game. I'm going to be wearing Alabama stuff because that's at the heart of who I am. If you don't, I don't care what anybody, I'm going to be who Jesus Christ is. I'm going to obey. I'm not just going to talk about church. I'm going to live. I'm not just going to talk about Jesus. I'm going to live Jesus. I'm not just going to shout a good game and, and, and profess that, yeah, man, I go to church and, and it's a lot of fun and it's really cool. I'm going to, there's going to be something different because God is not just somebody who's out there. He's somebody who's right here in my life, making the difference about how I talk and speak and see and do whatever it is I do. He's transforming my life. transforming my life. So the Pharisees were all taught. Jesus says, not just about what you say, it's about what you do. It's about sacrifice. I love you. Uh, we're we're going to look at another passage in, in Malachi, but it, it just, in, in summation, it, it just says, um, I hate, this is God talking to the people, I hate. You're bringing me these wounded lambs. You're bringing me these, these wounded goats for sacrifice. And it is detestable to me. And then he says something that scares me. He's like, I wish you would just shut the temple doors and don't even get together anymore. What you're doing is gross. You 
just shut the doors, just shut it up, just, just quit going. Because you're bringing me half of yourself, part of yourself, rather than all of yourself. You're just bringing me the leftovers rather than everything. And I can't do anything with that. So just quit getting together, quit making sacrifices, quit doing it, just quit, shut the door, don't let, for God, goodness sake, for my sake, you're, you're causing more harm than you are good. Just shut it down. I hope God doesn't look at my life and say, you know what, Jeremy, you should just stay home. Just stay home. You could just quit talking about me to other people. Because what you're saying with your life is shouting. They can't hear what you're actually saying with your lives. So just quit talking about me. That, that'll help me. I, I don't want God to look at me and say, man, Jeremy, if you could just shut it down and just. I want God to look at me and say, just keep following me. Keep turning your eyes into me. Keep allowing me to give you a fresh sense of my spirit. I'll keep flooding your life if you will just keep humbly coming before me. And keep you just keep being faithful to me. And people will see the difference in you because of what I'm doing in your life. God looks at the, the Pharisees and said, which one did? one who actually did what God wanted to do. He says the prostitutes and the tax collectors and all the, they listened to John, they heard John, and they turned and listened. You heard John, and you went the other way. What I'm calling you to do is saying that God is speaking to you. And what he wants for us is to obey. Hey, receive this blessing. May you, Paul de Nazarene, go this week. And may you, may you not just be talkers, but may you be doers. Not so that you can brag about how great you are, but so that you can brag about how big your God is. Go be doers, not so that you can be arrogant and prideful about how great you are. But go be doers because God has called us to be broken for all those people that we see every day. See you in the next one.